Welcome back to Safe Tech. This is uh, Transitional Justice, and we're going to talk about the brave women of Bangladesh. They are heroines, um, but it was almost 50 years ago, and uh, we need to know more about what happened there because we really haven't paid adequate attention. And Mahoum Kazi of uh, Project Expedite Justice has been working on this, and she's going to tell us more about what happened and what we are doing about it now all these decades later. Welcome to the show, Mahom. Thank you. Excited to be here. So uh, tell us your role at uh, at uh, Project Expedite Justice. Uh, what are you doing for them, and how does it connect with the genocide in 1971 in Bangladesh? So currently I'm working as a communications assistant at Project Expedite Justice, so um, really helping out with the social media and kind of just little other things here and there. Um, but I was kind of drawn to PEJ uh, because of their role working with survivors of mass atrocities today. And I found that really interesting um, because I've worked closely looking at the testimonies of survivors of mass atrocities, specifically of 1971, for the last almost three years now. Um, so I found that their mission to be really inspiring. Yeah, it is inspiring. Unfortunately, the world has not paid sufficient attention to it. Because the genocide, uh, at the very least, should be a lesson to the following generations. You know, we we need to learn and figure out the human condition uh, over any genocide. Uh, so, Maham, uh, you know, you're you're from your family is from Pakistan. You're a Muslim. Um, what what qualifies you to do this investigation? So, uh, well, I guess I can talk a little bit first about what intrigued me to do this investigation, which was the fact that my mother was born around kind of the same time as um, this war, this genocide was taking place. And she didn't actually find out about it until 40 years later when she was living in the U.S., um, well established here. And of course, they'd, they'd, all, all, they'd always known there was a war, but they didn't know the like specifics of it. Um, so that conversations with her kind of prompted it. And then conversations with the Bangladeshi friends at some points in my life, when I was as young as seven, they were like, oh, our country is used to be one country. And I had no idea of this either. Um, and then eventually this just became something that I thought like I needed to hold other Pakistanis, um, Pakistani diaspora, specifically people accountable for this, because we say never again so often. And I feel like that just kind of gets lost at some point. Um, and yeah, then I applied for my master's um, at Columbia University, and I got my master's in Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African studies, but I concentrated specifically on modern South Asian history from 1857 to modern day, um, and I focused a lot on 1971 and this genocide specifically. Now, did you realize when you selected that topic for your master's that uh, you would be in great uh, demand over the years that followed? Uh, you know. Uh, People really need to know more about the Middle Eastern and, uh, you know, what do they call Middle East and North African or African uh, studies to understand what's going on these days. So you have a, a tremendous uh, benefit there uh, to have that under your belt. Don't you agree? Yeah, I would, I would hope so. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, but you come at it um, from the at least the historical point of view of a Muslim whose mother was in Pakistan. Um, but I recall reading that this uh, genocide was um, was Pakistan, that is in East Pakistan, now known as Bangladesh, uh, against um, largely against the, the Hindu people in what is now known as Bangladesh. I mean, can are you are you biased in any way? Um, I don't think so because I think I I also find it important to make the distinction that there it wasn't necessarily a Hindus versus Muslim thing. The reason, a lot of the justification behind it was a Hindu versus Muslim thing. Um, that's what the Pakistani army told their uh, soldiers. The, a lot of the higher ups told, this is the, langu the language of justification that they used was, okay, well, we have the memory of 1947 of the partition of South Asia fresh in our minds. And that was a time of, I think, great pain for everyone, right? It was a time of celebration that we're free from British rule. We have these two separate countries. But at the same time, there was all this pain that came about because of that. And it made a lot of rivalries, obviously, um, between Hindus, Muslims, whoever have you. Um, so then going into 1971, where there's still kind of this disdain between Muslims and Hindus, 
they kind of use this language to rile everyone up. And there are a lot of soldier testimonies of when they found out like later that they had been lied to and that they were killing other Muslims because Bangladesh at the time did have a lot of Hindus. It had more Hindus or East Pakistan, I guess, at the time had a lot more Hindus than were in West Pakistan. But a lot of the people living in East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, they were also Muslim. Um, so when some of the soldiers had found out that they were killing other fellow Muslim brothers and sisters, they were extremely devastated by this. Um, and they, they, there's this, like a saying within, I guess, specifically within this field of like a few different authors who have studied this really closely. And they talk about how a lot of the testimonies of these soldiers, they talk about the loss of insaniyat. And insaniyat most closely means humanity. Um, so 1971 was a period of great loss of humanity um, in South Asia specifically. Well, let's, let's get uh, the, you know, the basic uh, history. So 1947, uh, India uh, gained independence from, from Britain, uh, mm -hmm. right? Uh, okay, and there, there followed this uh, big, uh, I guess it's uh, mostly a religious argument between um, the, the Muslims in Pakistan, and Pakistan was in two separate places, West Pakistan, now known as the current Pakistan, and East Pakistan, now known as Bangladesh, what a what a geographical mess that is! Okay? And and it was not a happy time because there was a lot of war going on, and there was a lot of resentment between uh, India, which was largely Hindu, uh, right, and and the Pakistan, which is large in both sides, largely Muslim. So, um, query: When did when did East Pakistan um, become Bangladesh? So East Pakistan, after nine months of war, um, became Bangladesh in 1971. So after this long war, but they were, as you said, um, they kind of these two territories of what was then West Pakistan and now or, and then East Pakistan. They're over a thousand kilometers away, um, and it was very interestingly divided up like that. It should not have been divided like that. And you have the kind of the bureaucratic center in West Pakistan, and then you have a lot more of the population being in East Pakistan. So it was, it was kind of a mess um, at that time. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, did they, you know, I, I know people who are, mm, they treat themselves as Indian, but they were born in West Pakistan. And um, when, uh, you know, Pakistan was separated from India, they moved back into India proper. Mm -hmm. um, but, but they see themselves as part of the original territory of Pakistan. It's really interesting that, that this separation is not quite not quite yet complete. Kind of, it's still, still people are integrated in, in their own way. Um, so uh, now, now we talk about women, and we talk about the heroic women of Bangladesh, and we need to know more about that. We need to know what your mother discovered forty years later. Uh, what exactly happened to the women in the course of this war that ultimately resulted in you know the um, uh, the, the change from East Pakistan to Bangladesh, 1971. Yeah, um, so in the kind of nine months of where the genocide was taking place, um, and the, the, there's been, I think the figures are really disputed. So anywhere from 30,000 to 3 million people were killed, um, like mostly Bangladeshi individuals, Bengali individuals during this time. Um, and the numbers of women who were assaulted sexually assaulted, raped, violated um, during this time also kind of ranges from like anywhere from like the lower thousands to 400,000. Um, and these women in the light of Bangladesh becoming a new, its own country, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the founder of Bangladesh, um, he basically gave them the term heroic women or birangona. So birangona means brave women, right? Um, or war heroines, so to speak. Um, and it that was, means heroic Bangladeshi women, right? Yes, heroic okay. Bangladeshi women. Um, and it was basically to honor these women who kind of had maybe in their eyes and like the eyes of like this new nation building effort, it was like, okay, like we need to kind of give them a place in our memory as well. We need to honor them in some way. So it, while it was done in a kind of, in a way to honor these women, I think it ended up a little bit backfiring because these women still ended up being ostracized in the new nation um, under the premise of like honor and all of this stuff. So, yeah. Wow. You know, um, just to jump forward for a minute, we'll cover the, you know, the, the events of the interim, but uh, the, 
uh, a U.S. representative in Congress um, introduced a resolution uh, in 2022, I think probably about a year ago, um, recognizing the genocide and, um, you know, making it a, a part of recognized Asian history. And uh, I'm not sure that it ever passed. And what, and what you have, and I'm sure you've, you've studied this, what you have is a failure to recognize what happened. It wasn't just that your mother didn't hear about it. It said it wasn't publicized. It just happened within the context of India and Pakistan and, and uh, Bangladesh. And, and uh, these are really troubling events. Um, but they never got covered. You really have to do research to find out what happened. Am I right? Yeah, you're completely right. Um, not only just in Pakistan, because in the period after the genocide, um, under uh, Zia al Haq, there was a lot of censorship under that regime. Um, and what I specifically studied was public memory and how textbook education kind of affects that in post-genocide Bangladesh and Pakistan, in liberated Bangladesh and in Pakistan. Um, but in the U.S. as well, which is interesting when you bring up the point about the current resolution and it not being passed, because there are records of, I believe it was President Nixon at the time. Um, and when, I guess, like the White House found out that um, these this killing these killings were happening, they were pretty indifferent to it at the time. Um, so, and this also all ha was happening during kind of the Cold War era. So, I don't know, maybe contextualizing it, but um, it's interesting that like there's now 52 years, or I guess maybe it might, it's going to be 53 years later now, almost. Um, now there's finally an effort to kind of break that silence. And it is, it's a huge step forward. Um, and there have been efforts in Pakistan as well to kind of to break that silence, but it's kind of a slow awakening. Well, you know what troubles me is that part of genocide, and this happened in the Ukraine war, it happened uh, with Hamas, uh, is rape. Um, in fact, you know, it's deeply built into the firmament of human history. And I don't understand, uh, you know, we, we, you and I have grown up in a civilized society where this is condemned. It's not appreciated at all. And, you know, you, you can go to jail for life um, for that. But query, why, why so much rape? And, and, you know, I know that in India, talk about India just for a minute, because I'm familiar with, you know, there seems to be this, this, um, this rape thing that has been publicized about young men raping young women on buses, as I recall. Um, and I don't understand why this happens. Is it a cultural thing? Is it a political thing? Is it a religious thing? Is it part of genocide? Wholesale rape really offends um, the sensibilities, don't you think? Mm -hmm. I think particularly placing rape or sexual violence in the context of what was happening in 1971 um, for, like, the, I guess the Pakistani government or the Pakistani military specifically at that time, it was, rape was used as a kind of a tool of cleansing the improper, impure hin Hindu, more Hindu Bengalis, um, because, because of colonial remnants that the uh, like the, the the Pakistani government or the Pakistani military took over after 1947, and when Pakistan, in a different way, became the colonial administrators for Bangladesh, Bangladesh again being East Pakistan at the time, um, there was kind of this idea that was portrayed where Bengalis were they were darker, they were um, you know they had all these qualities that kind of made them subservient in the eyes of Pakistanis, whereas Pakistanis specifically the Punjabi military elite. They were lighter skinned, they were taller, they were more suited for war and they were suited for those kinds of things. And that's why a lot of them, in specifically under British colonial rule, a lot of them were part of the military and things like that. Um, so when that kind of carried over, the army decided that, okay, this is going to be a project that we need to cleanse these women's wombs and we need to create a pure Pakistan, right? So by doing this, we'll be able to create a new nation of people who will be pure just like us. So in this case, not that all rapes that happened during the, during the war were by the Pakistanis to Bengali women, because there are instances of um, 
neighbors, like Bengali neighbors raping like the Bengali women. There were in so many different instances of like Bihari women, Bihari women being a specifically Urdu speaking ethnic minority group in Bangladesh, them being raped by Bengalis as well. Just there was, a, it was happening to everyone, um, unfortunately, or it was happening to the various different ethnic groups. Um, but in, I guess in the like general narrative, it was happening as a tool of kind of control of the population, which again, goes back to what you were saying about um, rape being used as a tool of genocide and ethnic cleansing. Yeah, I'm, okay, I want to uh, explore that just a little more. If I find that a given group is impure and, um, you know, uh, at, at a lesser level somehow, um, and, I, and I and wind up having my army rape them, um, th uh, oh, and you include in every culture in the world, the rape is an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. The rape is the worst thing that can happen to a woman, short of being killed. Um, so if I go and rape large numbers of women, um, I am embarrassing them. I am humiliating them. I am not improving their lives. I am not endearing them to my culture at all. I'm making them hate me. Mm -hmm. um, it, it creates widespread hate, for sure, and resentment that, that goes on and on and on. So that's, that's one aspect of it. But you suggest another aspect, uh, the cleansing aspect, is I want to I want to spread my seed. I want these women to to have babies that include my seed. I want to change their their DNA. Is is that part of this? I want to I want to make them make their children make their society more like mine. Um, I want to create a new race or a race that's closer to my race. But which of it, which of those things is is happening here? I think both to some degree, um, but because there was the whole thing of embarrassment and shame and izzat or respect or honor is a big part of, you know, like South Asian different like communities in South Asia. Like izzat is a really big thing. So specifically the rape then of the Birangona women was understood to some degree as also the rape of the entirety of Bangladesh, right? This was an embarrassment for the entirety of Bangladesh. Like, how could this have happened to us, right? And then these women were then ostracized and there were all these different issues. But also in order to, you know, with the project of, you know, making these impure women have pure children, um, there was another issue of a lot of these women who, after the war, were left with these children. They were forced to have abortions uh, by the Bangladeshi state. Mother Teresa's foundation also uh, like carried out some of those abortions, or they kind of lost the opportunity to be, not in all cases, of course, not this isn't a blanket statement, but in some cases, they also lost the opportunity to be mothers to these children. So a lot of these babies were put up for adoption. Um, there's a few different cases of this, and one of the books that it's really insightful on this whole topic. It's called Ami Birangwana Bolchi, or The War Heroine I Speak. Um, and that was written by an author, or it was written by Nilima Ibrahim, and it was translated by Nusrat Rabi. And that book kind of goes into more detail of different accounts of like war heroines actually speaking. So in, I would say since the 90s, there's been an effort kind of of these war heroines to come forward um, and tell their stories. Well, that's interesting that, you know, if a lot of women were raped in 1971 and they could not afford, didn't have the availability of an abortion um, and they gave birth, then you have a whole generation of children who are a product of that rape. It reminds me of, uh, of Vietnam, you know, the GIs who went to Vietnam, uh, they, they had children by the Vietnamese women and uh, they were called Hosoi. And nobody liked them because they were neither Vietnamese nor American, right? Um, so what happened to this generation of all the children that were born of the this large number of rapes in and around 1971? Are they identifiable? Uh, can you call them up and can you talk to them? Can Will they tell you who they are? Uh, is there an organization of them? Be, because right now they must be, what, 40, 40 plus, 50, almost 50 years old, these people. And there must be plenty of them, no? I would assume so, but also I think it's very contextual because some of the accounts of this, some of the women, you know, are like a lot of them 
are urban, some of them are in villages, and so they, they're spread out all across different districts of Bangladesh. So I don't think there's really a unifying factor for this generation, or in some cases, some of the women actually, after the, um, Bangladesh's liberation, they went to Pakistan to find the people who had assaulted them um, and try to like say, this is your child. And this is one of the stories, I believe, in Ami Birangwana Bolchi, where one of the women goes to Pakistan, and then she's kind of forced to like live there in private. But it does create this whole problem of, okay, now you have this whole group of people who are neither here nor there, like you were saying, um, especially for like, how can they pledge allegiance to one country or the other? But I don't think that's as prominent necessarily of a thing in this case specifically. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it's interesting that uh, somebody went back to try to find um, the father, I guess. That's an interesting story. It sounds like a great movie, actually. Um, all of this sounds like a great movie. I, I hate to put it in those terms. So why are these women heroes? What did they do in that war and after that war to 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 uh, organize themselves, um, to deal with those who would attack them, to deal with the um, Pakistanis who were mm, abusing them? Uh, why are they heroes? So the term hero or heroine in this context was more so just a name given to them um, besides being called war heroines, they weren't really afforded necessarily any sort of respect in um, the main society. The term birangona was also, to in some levels of society, misconstrued as barangona. I'm also not entirely sure of the pronunciation of that, because that's a term I've only ever read on paper. I've never heard said out loud. Um, and barangona means prostitute. So it was also used as kind of a demeaning term um, to denote them afterwards. In terms of them being honored as heroes or heroines in the larger context, um, if they had gotten any recognition for it or anything like that, uh, their absence is really visible from the public memory of Bangladeshis. Um, of course, everyone in, in Bangladesh, is, they're, they're very aware of it. But at the same time, if you go to the, um, there's a, one of the biggest memorials or war museums in Bangladesh, in Dhaka, I believe, um, they have, they're honoring a, like female fighters, like freedom fighters, and there's a small number of freedom fighters that are actually honored. But at the same time, the war heroines who are also deemed this award, they're kind of absent from those walls. Um, so there's that. And then besides that, there's an, a large effort to rehabilitate these women after the war. On um, the Bangladeshi government, they uh, tried paying men to marry these women so that they could, you know, just like they could enter into marriages. They would not have to face that shame anymore. They would be okay with this and it'd be fine. A lot of the times the men were like the men in their lives were paid. So either sometimes it was their husbands or they would try to find a husband for them, pay the husband. Sometimes they would try to pay their brothers. They would bribe them with cars. They would bribe them with all, with all these different things. Or in other cases, they like started different like rehabilitation centers where they could um, train them in different areas and then let them be of use to the larger society. Hmm. Well, that's very constructive, actually. Now, did they keep the children? So when you find them a husband, Back in the seventies, um, did 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 they come along with a child as a product of the rape? Um, I think it was again very dependent on each case because I, some children did end up in adoption centers, some women just did not want to, and then some women were really like you know they were like absolutely not that is my child no matter what. Um, but a lot of the women just the idea of the fact that they had to get married in honor to be in order to be respected in the society. Um, after, you know, what had happened to them was not obviously their choice, it was no one's choice, um, but the perpetrators, um, and a very terrible one, of course, at that, but um, it, yeah, they, it, it was very, I think all of these cases are very context dependent, because the other thing to keep in mind with this is you don't have as many women kind of speaking out about it, like the, the, the kind of, the accounts that you'll hear are very few and far between, um, just because not a lot of people want to come forward, even almost 53 years later now. Yeah, even now. Yeah. Well, it's not the kind of thing you want to talk about publicly, but it sounds like, from what you say, um, that the country, the people, the population, um, you know, is, is is in touch with this. They remember it. Uh, even if the people in Pakistan don't remember it, don't never knew about it, um, you know, the the people here in Bangladesh, 
they remember. Am I right? This has got to be part of their their heritage. I hate to use that word, but their their historical experience, no? Mm -hmm. And they they are very proud of it, and rightfully so. They should be proud of the fact that, not the fact of these women, but they should be proud of the fact that they had this liberation where they were successful in gaining victory. Um, uh, But I do have several Bengali friends, one of whom told me like accounts of going to his grandmother's village and seeing the bullet holes in the walls that are still there, again, 45, 50 years later. Um, So this is very prevalent in their memories to this day. Um, That same friend, his father's friend saw his friends killed in front of his eyes. So this isn't even like, this is, these are people from who could be of my father's generation, of my grandfather's generation, if I really want to put it that way. Like, it's very, very, very fresh still. Mm-hmm. Did these women, the, the ones who we treat as uh, heroes, did they fight? In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. Again, very context dependent. Mm-hmm. I, can, I saw a photograph of, uh, of a troop of women, uh, Bangladeshi women. Um, marching down the street looked like they were ready. They were participating in the military action to deal with the Pakistani uh, um, attackers. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know exactly where or when or to what degree. So here we are, in 2023, and you are investigating. And Project Expedite Justice investigates these things, and you take statements. And you know. Uh, We've talked to a lot of people from PEJ, and usually the atrocities happen within recent memory. In this case, it's not within recent memory. In this case, uh, people are people involved getting older. Um, They are dying. Uh, They or they simply uh, have rejected this part of their own personal history. They don't want to talk about it. Um, So it's a project for you to go out and get a statement from somebody. How do you do that? That's the, that's my first question. My second question is going to be, what do you do with it? But let's talk about getting the statements, because it sounds like that is very difficult. Huh? Getting the statements is really extremely difficult. Um, in my time, while I was getting my master, or working towards my master's thesis specifically, I was never able to get a statement from anyone themselves. I had to rely on the works of different authors who worked more closely with this, like Nayanika Mukherjee, Yasmin Sekia. These are people who actually went and lived in Bangladesh in some cases and you know gained the trust of these women in order to get statements from them. I highly, highly doubt that someone like me could go and get statements from people. I could I could get statements about the war, I could get statements about the genocide, but specifically from war heroines, I, that would be extremely difficult. But there are artists in recent years, especially in the UK, who have been making more of an effort to kind of document these things, whether through plays, through movies. There's a lot of different efforts now, which is, I think it's good that the silence is being broken in the way it is. Well, I think you know, that's true. You you don't need to have a lot of statements. You don't need thousands of people to make statements to find out what happened uh, or to make a movie or to write a book or an article. Uh, so there's a value in, in getting only just a few to find out hmm, what happened. Um, and where do, you, where do you put those statements? Do, you know, it's not like the uh, international court is going to do anything with those statements. What do you what do you do with them? Do you, do you bind them up and, and propagate them somewhere? Do you write a book, an article, make a movie? What do you do with those so the world learns? I think the best, I guess, course of action or that, you know, authors, like, you know, so many authors that I was able to, like, you know, learn from their works during the time that I was working on this, um, their best, like, word of advice was just to make sure these women's voices are heard and make sure these their memories aren't forgotten. And that's why maybe I also feel like my duty as a Pakistani woman is to learn their stories because this is something that my country kind of did against these women. So it's my duty to learn this and it's my duty to educate other people. Um, and that's the only thing we can do because there was a commission that was started, I think, um, when Bangladesh was freshly liberated and everything, there was an effort to kind of get these survivors justice but that died out because a lot as time kept going on um, a lot of the perpetrators were dying or they were rehabilitated into different into Pakistani society and Bangladeshi society but quietly or they were rehabilitated into politics which kind of um, coerced these women again into silence Mm, yeah so from a political or maybe a geopolitical point of view how is the relationship now knowing what we do know 
um, between Bangladesh and Pakistan. Uh, is, is have we had a denouement there? Is it um, is it friendly, or do people um, you know hold these events um, between the two countries? Um, I think in recent years there have been more efforts um, from Pakistani specifically or Pakistanis in Pakistan specifically in academic spaces um, to speak out about these things. But there is still a lot of censorship going on um, in some different ways. I think because of everything going on in Pakistan right now, the political situation, more and more people are inclined to learn and more and more people are apologizing about, you know, the, the fact that the genocide happened or the fact that they didn't know that it happened. Um, so I think the two countries are on relatively good terms right now. Um, there isn't necessarily a, a huge amount of hatred, but at, at the same time, I think there is still, especially from a Pakistani standpoint, there is still this like, don't ask, don't tell kind of thing. Like they, they'd rather enjoy the silence than, you know, have to confront these uncomfortable realities. Mm, uncomfortable realities indeed. So has, has there been accountability? Has accountability, has there been accountability in uh, Pakistan um, with the people who, uh, you know, uh, did this? Or, or has there been accountability in, in uh, Bangladesh with the people who maybe somehow um, participated in it? Um, or has there been no accountability on either side? What do you think? I think if there has been any accountability, it's been very, very little um, to a degree where it probably wouldn't be noticed, like notable at all. Um, and again, a lot of them, a lot of the perpetrators were kind of just rehabilitated into society at large. Like it never really was a widespread thing that, okay, we need to go after them. Um, they were in a lot of cases, specifically, I want to say in Yasmin Sekia's book, Nayanika Mukherjee's book and Nalima Ibrahim's book, these perpetrators kind of just like, you know, were able to live comfortably. They could maybe talk about it. I know a few of these authors actually travel to Pakistan um, to talk to some of the perpetrators there. And they also talked to some perpetrators in Bangladesh. Um, so, you know, they were able to talk about it years later, but there was never anything that, okay, let's get them thrown, you know, behind bars or let's, let's get them to, you know, let, let's have a settlement. Let's do something. There was never really any, any movement for that. Mm. So here's my, my final area I want to ask you about. We do this. We study it. We write about it. We take statements and we somehow mm, we 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 use that as raw material in order to find out what happened. But also, it seems to me that we do this for another reason. We do this to find out what what motivated people to do this. Uh, what motivated the world not to intervene, which is troubling, what motivated the United States to turn its back on what was happening in 1971. Um, and I guess what the question is, and I put it to you, you must be thinking about it. What have we learned from this? What can we learn from this? What should we learn from this? Because, you know, honestly, Mahomet keeps on happening. It, this genocide thing, a mass rape thing, it keeps on happening. We have simply got to stop that from happening. Um, I don't know if the UN is the right organization for it. Uh, I don't know if the International Court is the right you know, tribunal for it. I don't know if universal jurisdiction uh, ha you know, counts. But it happened in Ukraine. It happened on October 7th. It's, it's going to continue to happen. You know, we say never again, never again, like 1971, and yet it happens again. What should we do? What should we learn? How can we stop this from happening? How can we make it clear that this is not acceptable conduct? That's a really good question. I think it, it, I would not know how to answer that, honestly, um, because as you said, saying never again is nearly never enough because you can see it um, kind of happening today. In, you know, different parts of the world, you can see it happening whenever there's conflict taking place. And it just, I guess, it's part of conflict. And fortunately, it shouldn't be. But you're right, like, what what organization can you really even take this to in order for there to be like, reparations or there to be any sort of, you know, punishment or like any sort of way to move past this stuff? I I would just hope that one day we're able to live in a world where we don't have to hear about this stuff continuously happening. Um, but I, I wouldn't know how to, 
when people are still too uncomfortable to speak about certain silences, then uh, I don't, I don't think they could ever be kind of confronted with, again, these uncomfortable realities. Um, so I think it will take maybe a long time for things to, things to change. Well, let me answer that question, my own question in part, okay? It's to make the world aware of what happened, uh, of the horror of what happened, to make the world aware that this is a horrible atrocity and has terrible effects on people and communities um, and cultures. And so what, what you're doing has value right there. What you're doing here today on ThinkTech has value. And uh, I would say that, uh, that that resolution in Congress has value. I uh, hope it gets passed. So um, to, to, make it, to make it known has value. I can't, and with you, I can't think of anything else. But I think that is something that's doable. And it's not, you know, it's, it's, there's no great barrier um, to do it. So keep on doing your work, Mom. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today. It's been great to learn from you. And uh, I really appreciate um, what you are saying and what you are studying and what you are doing. No, thank you so much for having me. I, it was great to talk about everything I've learned over the last three years. Yeah. Thanks for doing that. Aloha.